Thanks for the love, Kevin, Keith, and Z. And Cecile, the mic is yours. Thank you. Welcome to Quantum Photonics. So uh, I'd like you to hear a sound. Mm -hmm. This is a recording from one of the experiments done by the group of our guest speaker. And we have a very, very interesting topic today. And I noticed someone already was uh, uh, saying something about uh, why do flies fall in love. And uh, yeah, uh, very interesting comments. And I just want to tell everybody who have been here for the first time in quantum photonics that uh, basically we invite serious researchers like our guest speaker who uh, we discuss serious science here and uh, serious researchers like our guest speaker to tell us about a recent published paper that they have and also about the work that they had done in their lab. So like a Valentine's Day dinner or a box of chocolates, male fruit flies have their own rituals for wooing a potential mate. As part of a complex courtship behavior, male flies vibrate their wings to produce a distinctive song that conveys a message to nearby females. Using internal information and cues from females and the environment, males decide from moment to moment whether to sing and how. And although scientists now know a lot about how fly movements produce songs, it is still not clear which cells and circuits in the fly's nervous system enable behavior. And so because of new interesting questions and new technology, we just heard the sound that we heard a while ago when we opened the room, uh, because uh, yeah, we have scientists who ask a very, very relevant question for us to understand what's happening in science. So now a suite of novel tools, including custom fly recording studio. Wow. A custom fly recording studio, researchers at HHMI's Janilia Research Campus have pinpointed the group of neurons in the nerve cord, a structure analogous to our spinal cord, that produce and pattern the fly's uh, two major courtship songs. They also measured neuronal activity in the cells while flies were singing to understand how these neurons control each type of song. So to introduce to you our special guest speaker, uh, Dr. Josh uh, Lilbis is a research scientist at the Howard Hughes uh, Medical Institute's uh, Janilia Research Campus. Josh is a first generation college student that completed his undergraduate work at Ohio State University. In his graduate work with Paul Katz at the Georgia State University, he used an electrophysiology based comparative approach to identify neural mechanisms underlying individual and species differences in sea slug swimming behavior. Since moving to Janelia, uh, he has collaborated with a multidisciplinary group of researchers, including Barry Dixon, David Stern, Yun Ding, Paul Tilburg, and Stefan uh, C. Salfield to develop new methods in genome editing and neural circuit reconstruction that enable the structural, physiological, and functional properties of neural circuits to be compared across individual species at scale. His recent work 
has utilized this novel approach to reveal neural circuit mechanisms underlying individual and species differences in drosophilia courtship behavior. So without further ado, I proudly and excitedly bring to you our special guest speaker, Dr. Joshua Lilbis. Josh, welcome to Quantum Photonic. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for that nice introduction, uh, Cecile. I feel like I could skip a lot of the things we want to talk about because it's already so well introduced. Um, but I'll try to go over some some of these concepts um, again a little bit and then dive dive into the, some of the recent research. Um, so um, for those that are looking at the slides that are attached, I'll update kind of what slide I'm on every once in a while, but hopefully even without that, um, you'll be able to hear some interesting things and, and get a sense of, of what we learned from this work. Um, so the, the major focus of what I'll talk about today um, was some, some efforts that I made with my collaborators to try to identify uh, the neural basis of uh, courtship song in Drosophila melanogaster. And so really you know, trying to kind of see, I guess, how flies fall in love. Uh, before I start, I do want to acknowledge you know, the main contributors to this work along with myself. Um, so there's Kai Wang, uh, Hiroshi Shiozaki, David Stern, and Barry Dixon were the major contributors on, on this particular set of publications. But there are a number of other contributors as well, many of which are at Genelia, uh, the research campus. Uh, and these are people that helped generate genetic reagents and, and um, generate this song recording uh, studio that I'll, that I'll talk about. about and also uh, major contributions from the Genelia Fly EM team and the Cambridge uh, Connectomics team led by Greg, excuse me, Greg Jeffress. Uh, these groups really put in a tremendous effort to generate um, connectomes of the nervous system for these flies, which I'll talk about a bit more in a, in a second. All right, so I do want to start with the behavior, and then I'll dive into why we're interested in this behavior and, and what we learned. Um, so for those that are following along, you'll hear that song that Cecile played again, um, but you'll also be able to see the flies um, if you're watching. Um, so you'll be able to click play on, on slide, floor, si slide four and see this. So what you'll see is a male fly following a female, and that male is going to extend a single wing toward the female uh, and produce one of two courtship song types, uh, either pulse song, which is kind of a series of pup, 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 pulses, and then sign song, which is like a hum. And then the sign might be a little more difficult to hear. So it's, it's a lower amplitude song. All right, so a couple of things to note before you see and hear this. Um, number one, these behaviors are innate. So males emerge as adults with the ability to produce this behavior, the song. They don't need to learn it um, like you know a lot of other species do. Uh, females similarly innately have preferences for songs by, produced by their species. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and then also, you know, these are really stereotype songs, which I'll show you, but they also vary, you know, on a moment to moment basis in a really dynamic way. Um, and so what you'll be able to see in here are basically just the male switching which song he produces kind of on a moment to moment basis. And as it turns out, some of these choices are, are based on what the female is doing. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and play this now. Okay, so that's you know a basic example of what song looks like, at least in this really controlled environment. Um, if we look a little closer at song, we, we can see on slide five uh, is what the waveform or the audio you know uh, wave file of these songs look like uh, when they're kind of you know blown up. So we can see that on a really fine scale. So we can see that there are these pulses shown in green, and then the sign song shown in blue. And pulses and sign both have their characteristic uh, frequencies. Uh, and there's also a characteristic interval between the pulses that these flies produce. In the case of Drosophila melanogaster, that interval is 35 milliseconds. Uh, and then there are characteristic amplitudes of pulse and sign song as well. But again, these things do vary uh, depending on you know what the female is doing and also what else is happening in the environment and the internal state of the male. So the male is going to you know vary whether or not he wants to sing at all and which song to sing and how loud to sing based on you know, time of day, if he's hot or cold, if he's hungry, previous experience trying to mate, and then also what the female is doing. And so like as a kind of simplified but uh, accurate example of this, uh, males will produce pulse song more commonly when they're far away from the female and running fast, and they'll produce pulse loudly. And when they get closer to the female and slow down, they'll start to produce more sign song, and the pulse that they produce is a little quieter, right? So there's this really kind of dynamic moment-to-moment -moment variation 
in the song that these flies produce, right? So this is a kind of a, you know, an interesting behavior to be able to study because it's, you know, it's, it's complex and dynamic, but it's also something that we can really kind of stereotype and quantify, which is nice. And I'll talk about some advantages of that in a bit. Uh, in addition to this variation that exists over time, there's also a tremendous amount of variation that exists across species. So on slide seven, we can see the waveforms of a few different species in their songs. Uh, and I'll play these in, in just a second so you can hear what some of this sounds like. Um, and so a kind of amazing thing is that as far as we can tell, every Drosophila species that does sing a song uh, sings a unique song, right? And so somehow, or not somehow, but basically each species has evolved at least little tweaks to very large differences in the songs that they produce. And females really care about these differences, right? They're, they're really interested in the songs that their species produce. So for example, the interval between pulses in Drosophila melanogaster is about 35 milliseconds. And you can actually find neurons in the Drosophila melanogaster female flies that are specifically tuned to this, to this 35 millisecond difference uh, in between pulses, right? So you can record from those neurons and see when you play pulses with 35 millisecond intervals that those neurons are active. If you make it longer, if you make it 100 milliseconds or you make it shorter, you make it 15 milliseconds, those neurons are no longer active, right? So females really care about not just whether the males sing, but the quality of those songs. And, you know, the reason why this would be is that, you know, it's a waste of females' time to mate with the male of another species where they can't actually reproduce. And so the female hears songs that they like, and they'll actually spend time listening to that song and considering whether or not to mate with that male. And if they hear a song from another species, they'll just, they won't waste their time, right? They'll reject that male or they'll fly away. So it's a really kind of sophisticated system that, you know, enables flies to really most uh, efficiently use their their resources and their energy, you know, um, to find food or whether to mate or not mate. Okay, so let me just play some of these songs so you can uh, hopefully appreciate how kind of dynamic these songs are across species. Uh, I'll start with Drosophila melanogaster again really quick. Okay, here's a closely related species uh, called Drosophila simulans. Right, so that sounds really similar. It is pretty similar, but the pitch is higher and there are some other differences as well. Here's a Drosol more uh, distantly related species, uh, Drosophila, Drosophila ananasae. And then here's a, another cool one from Drosophila persimilis. All right, so this is just you know a small number of species that produce these songs. They can produce these wildly different songs just by vibrating their wings in different patterns, which I think is pretty, pretty cool. Okay, so I want to kind of briefly talk about what questions we can address by studying these behaviors. Like, so why would we bother doing this? Uh, I mean, one reason is just because, you know, I'm interested in learning about the world that we live in. And I think it's really kind of cool to see all these different things that animals can do, including these fruit flies that you might see flying around your kitchen that have all of these really sophisticated behaviors. Uh, but in addition to this kind of general curiosity about the world, the world and life, there are some really kind of fundamental questions about neuroscience and the neural basis of behavior that we can address by studying this behavior. I'm just going to list three of them, but there are three that are, you know, that I'm focused on personally. Um, the first, and this is the one that I'll really kind of focus on today, is the question of how nervous systems control a common set of muscles to produce multiple behaviors. Um, so this is something that is really important to us and animals in general, right? So my ability to talk right now and make all of these different sounds to you know, raise the volume of my voice or lower it or slow it down or speed it up, I'm taking a common set of muscles and I'm just dynamically basically controlling them in different ways to produce all these different sounds. It's not just you know audio communication, but our ability to do you know fine hand movements to just be able to run over a rocky road these are using a common set of muscles to do different things um, we really don't have believe it or not a good sense of how nervous systems actually do this right there's a, a number of different ways this could be done you could have completely separate circuits controlling you know different types of rhythms you could have a common circuit that controls every rhythm and is modulated in different ways and this is something that you know uh, we don't know much about and it would be extremely useful to understand how circuits, you know, can dynamically control a common set of muscles. Uh, another question is how nervous systems integrate multiple internal and external cues on a moment to moment basis to control behavior, right? So not just how a common set of muscles are controlled, but 
you know, how do you take in visual information, olfactory information, you know, sound? Uh, how do you integrate that with whether you're hungry or not, whether you're tired or not, to make, you know, really rapid decisions? You know, neuroscience has been really advancing quickly recently, and we know a good deal about chunks of each of these things. You know, we know how sens certain senses are transmitted through the nervous system. We know how decisions are made in some systems. But to be able to actually understand this from the sensory system all the way to the motor output uh, has been really elusive because it's been a difficult uh, task to really get a handle on complete complex circuits like this. And, and this is something that studying fly courtship could enable us to do. Um, and the final question that I'm going to kind of briefly address is how nervous systems and behaviors evolve. You know, because these behaviors are different in every single species, if we can figure out how they work in one species, like Drosophila melanogaster, then hopefully we could be able to go in into other species and see how circuits have changed or how they're tweaked to produce different behaviors. And I think this is really, you know, a fundamental question about life on Earth, but also really about trying to understand how circuits can vary to produce behavior differences and how dysfunctions might arise or how we can treat dysfunctions. And it's just something that we have a really poor understanding of in general. Okay, so these are some kind of fundamental things we can address by studying fly courtship song. Uh, another thing I think worth briefly talking about is that's fine that we could do that, but why would we do this in a fly? Like, couldn't we possibly address these questions in a mouse or, you know, other vertebrates or other species in general? Um, and the answer is that we can address some of these things in other species, and it's definitely worth studying these questions in, in as many places as we can. Um, but at the moment, we have a suite of experimental tools and flies that are really kind of exceptional and provide a unique opportunity uh, to address these questions, you know, with real cell type specificity and complex circuits. And so there's just been a lot of work that's gone on over the past 10 years that has made doing this type of work in flies, you know, really experimentally advantageous. And so hopefully I'll be able to uh, touch on a bit of this so you can appreciate it um, when I'm done. I'm just going to show you those three examples of some of the tools that we have at our disposal, uh, many of which that I've developed with my colleagues um, that I'll talk about using today to basically understand courtship song. All right, so the first thing we have is we can really record a ton of behavior uh, in high throughput and we can analyze it essentially automatically. Um, so as an example of this, uh, this is the Sci Fly Song Recording Studio that we built. It's uh, recently put this paper out on uh, BioArchive, so it's freely available. Uh, we call it Song Torrent. This is on slide 12. This, uh, this device allows us to record 96 individual or pairs of flies simultaneously while we optogenetically stimulate those flies. So we can record a lot of behavior in high throughput. And then uh, Ben Arthur, David Stern, and colleagues have developed a uh, software, machine learning based software program called Song Explorer that takes all of that audio data and just automatically uh, segments it into its component parts. So identifies all the signs and all the pulse uh, waves. And then I wrote some additional software that allows me to basically compile all the stats from that machine learning software so that we can quantify everything you could want to know about song. And we can do this all pretty much automatically. And so I'll touch upon this in a bit, but I mean, this allows me to really quantify thousands of hours of song from thousands of flies. And, and this is really, I think, important when you're trying to understand behavior in general and when you're trying to understand how, you know, neural circuits control behavior. And this uh, on slide 13, if you press play, is just a quick video of what this looks like. So this is a single experiment. These are 96 different chambers of flies courting each other simultaneously. I'm not playing any audio here because it would just sound really intense to hear 96 flies singing all at the same time. But, you know, we can just record a tremendous amount of really high quality data very quickly. In addition to the ability to record and quantify behavior, uh, we have the ability to visualize, to monitor the activity of, and to manipulate neurons in Drosophila with cell type specificity um, using genetic reagents. Um, I can talk about the details of how we do this later, but briefly I can show you basically an example of what we can do with this type of technology. All right, so now what I'm, I'm introducing on slide 15 for the first time is the brain and the ventral nerve cord, so the analog of our spinal cord of the fly. And in this brain and ventral nerve cord, I've highlighted a single neuron. This is called PIP10. It's shown in green. There's one cell body per hemisphere of this cell type. And so what I'm showing here is we have generated a genetic reagent that allows us to label that neuron. In this case, I'm expressing a green fluorescent protein in the neuron, so you can visualize the anatomy of that neuron in green. 
but we could also express a calcium indicator in that neuron. And I'll show you an example later where we can image activity of the neuron. So it's electrophysiological or calcium activity while the fly is behaving, you know, so we can really see how that neuron responds or produces behavior in real time. And in addition to that, we can also manipulate these neurons uh, optogenetically with light. And so let me show you and let you hear an example of what this is like. So on the right side, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I have a single fly. This is just a male fly in a courtship chamber by himself. And I've uh, expressed an optogenetic activator in these neurons PIP10. And when I shine a red light on the fly, I'll basically be turning these neurons on. I'll be exciting them. And you'll hear the fly start to sing, even though he's by himself and there's, there's no female to court. So let me just play that now. All right, so I think it's a pretty incredible tool that we have, right? We have the ability to label specific neurons cleanly. We can turn those neurons on, we can turn them off, we can visualize their activity, we can look at their anatomy. And this is a really powerful thing that we can do in flies, not just for this neuron PIP10, but for thousands of cell types in the nervous system, some more of which I'll show you in, in a bit. And finally, on top of all of that, we also have full connectomes of the central nervous system in these animals. Right, so connectomes are an actual circuit wiring diagram of every neuron in the nervous system of these animals. The way that we've done this, or not we've done this, actually this has done, been done by a number of colleagues at Genelia and, and outside of Genelia, they've taken EM images, electron microscopy images of the entire nervous system. These images are of high enough resolution and good enough contrast that every single neuron can be actually traced out and all of their synaptic connections can be identified. So in this way, you can find any neuron that you're interested in the nervous system. You can trace that neuron out and you can say, what neuron is this connected to? You know, which neurons does it make strong connections to, weak connections? And in this way, we can really start to try to appreciate how information actually flows through the nervous systems and through the circuits of these animals. All right, so on slide 17, unfortunately, I can't get this movie to play in PDF, but hopefully what you can see just by looking at this image, on the right side is a ventral nerve cord. And about halfway down, just to the right of the midline, there's like a little square there. That little square is blown up on the left. And what you're looking at is a cross section of neurons and each neuron is in a different color. So basically we can just go through this volume, click on these neurons, identify neurons that we're interested in and find all of their connections. And I'll show you in a little bit why I think this is, or not why I think, why I know it's extremely powerful to help us understand really how circuits operate. All right, so in total, we've got this really kind of tremendous set of tools at our disposal that are really unique to Drosophila, you know, that allow us to investigate, you know, complex behavioral questions in a complex neural nervous system with cell type specificity in a really sophisticated way. Um, and so I'm using that approach to, to look at courtship song, um, and in this case, to really address the question of how nervous systems control a common set of muscles to produce multiple behaviors. That's the thing I hopefully will be able to kind of address today and then we can talk about kind of the implications of, of that if you're interested afterward. All right, so this is the basic premise on uh, slide 20 here, is that we've got the nervous system and we're interested in behaviors that are controlled by wings. So far I've talked about song, which includes pulse and sign song, but of course the wings also control flight in these animals and flight has a number of different types of modes and modulations as well, right? And so we know that there's essentially a common set of muscles that control all of these behaviors. So there's a couple of muscles that seem to be flight specific, a couple that seem to be song specific, but otherwise you've got a completely overlapping set of muscles that somehow allow the flies, flies to fly or allow them to sing these different songs. Right? And so what I want to understand is how this is done. How does the nervous system actually control these muscles so dynamically? All right, so there are basically two different distinct possibilities and then a spectrum in between. So one possible way this works is that there are separate circuits for pulse song, for sign song, and flight. The other possibility is that there's one circuit that controls all of these behaviors. And then you could have something in between where some neurons are flight specific, some are pulse specific, some are sign specific, or something like this, right? But we have basically no idea. Uh, and this is largely true of other behaviors across the animal kingdom like this. We just don't have a good sense of if there are kind of any kind of fundamental organizing principles on how the nervous system does this. And so 
we want to address this in flies and hopefully that provides some clues to how it might be done in other animals and, and people can explore these questions you know across the animal kingdom and in humans all right so the way that we went about doing this was the first thing we did is we generated a bunch of genetic reagents or fly lines that targeted specific neurons that we thought might control song. Uh, we had some clues from the previous literature that suggested cell types that might be involved in song. And so we generated 60 clean genetic reagents like the ones that I showed for PIP10 and that I'm showing again on slide 22 uh, that covered 40 different cell types that we thought were critical for song. We then identified all of those neurons in the electron microscopy connectome, which is shown on the right. And then you can overlay them in the center and we can see that we've basically generated clean genetic reagents for 40 different cell types uh, which unfortunately i can't get these slides to play on the pdf um, but you can see all of these in, in the paper uh in current biology uh, and we've identified all of these neurons in the connectome and so in this way we could basically test how these neurons or whether these neurons play a role in song and if they do we can look at the connectome and see how they're connected to each other okay so I'm going to show you, or excuse me, so with those genetic reagents, I did a series of optogenetic experiments uh, similar to the ones that I showed previously where I activated those neurons in isolated males to try to assess the functions of these neurons. Uh, one experiment is pairing a male with a female, and when you do this, the male will just sing and sing and sing, it'll sing song forever. Uh, and every 10 seconds, I would give a short pulse of light to silence or inhibit these neurons. So in this way, I could see what happens to ongoing courtship song when you quiet or silence particular cell types. So we can really see how those neurons affect song production. I also tested how activating those neurons in isolated males affected song. So basically, could flies produce song if you just activate those neurons in isolated males? I showed you an example of a cell type earlier where that was the case. And I also tested whether activating neurons during ongoing song affected the actual song output. Right, so we basically did three different types of manipulations to see how neurons influence song production. Our ability to record and analyze in high throughput allowed me to analyze over 1,800 hours of song from over 5,000 male flies. And I quantified everything you could possibly be interested in about song to really, I think, comprehensively address or assess how these 40 cell types affect courtship song. Let me give you a sense of what that looked like. Um, if you're following along, I'm on slide 27 now, and so I'll be rolling through some of these slides to show you what some of the output of these experiments looks like. So we're looking at a neuron called BMS12. And when we silence this neuron in a fly that's singing pulse song, so shown here by a green light bar, this is silencing that neuron, you can see that fly stops singing pulse song. If I take Every instance of flies that sing pulse at the moment that I silence these neurons, and I just put them in a row. So we just have little green dashes every time the fly is singing pulse. And then we put them in row after row after row. We can see that quite consistently when you silence this neuron that they stop singing pulse. And we can quantify it in another way in this box plot on the right, that when there's no green light on, so at zero on the x-axis, the fly sing, you can see on the y-axis, about 175 pulses per minute. But as soon as we start silencing these neurons at three, five, eight microwatts per millimeter squared of green light, you just immediately basically stop pulse. So the flies can't sing pulse anymore when these neurons can't fire action potentials. Notably, this is really specific to pulse. So if you look at sign song, if you just look at the, the box plot on the far bottom right, you can see that it doesn't matter if the green light's shining or not, the flies still just sing sign song. All right, so this was, I think, a cool result. These neurons really are required for pulse and as far as we can tell it seems like you know the flies sing sign just fine when these neurons aren't firing and it turns out there are four cell types that have this kind of characteristic there's bms12 bms9 dpr1 pmp2 and all of these to one degree or another when you silence them the flies can't sing pulse anymore or they sing less pulse whereas sign is either perfectly fine or they actually increase the amount of sign song that they sing so these neurons either don't matter for sign at all, or they you know, actively inhibit it. And so when you silence these neurons, sign starts being sung instead. On the other hand, there are two cell types that have kind of the opposite effect or opposite phenotype. So TN1A and DMS2, shown on slide 33, 
when you silence those neurons, pulse is completely fine. They sing plenty of pulse song, but when you look on the bottom, you can see that si sign song is just completely abolished, right? So these neurons are really specifically required to produce normal amounts of sign song. And then there are two cell types that are required to produce both pulse and sign song. So VPR9 and PIP10, when you silence them, you significantly reduce and more or less eliminate the ability to produce both pulse and sign. So PIP10 is that neuron that I showed you earlier, that descending uh, neuron that is really you know, critical for song in that when we activate it in isolated males, the flies sing, uh, uh, sing song. And so that's this neuron now when we silence it. Okay, so this in total were all of the neurons that were required to produce song in the fly. So of everything we tested, these were, were the neurons that seemed to really matter. And so now what we could do is we could go into the connectome and we could look at how these neurons are connected to each other to really see what the song circuit looks like. All right, so I'm going to show you that on slide 36, uh, which looks a bit overwhelming, but I'll just try to break down what's important about uh, this circuit diagram. All right, so first off on the left, this is the anatomy of these neurons in the ventral nerve cord or the, the analog of our spinal cord. Some of the cell types have just one cell body per hemisphere. Some have 10. Um, and I'm grouping all cell types into a single node on the right. So you can see basically a single circle for, you know, the cell type PIP10 or the cell type TN1A, right? On the bottom right there, there's a little key for the number of connections. And the thing that I'd like you to appreciate is just how strongly connected these neurons are to each other, right? So for example, some of these neurons have as many as 10,000 synaptic connections between them. And it's uh, worth knowing that in the fly nervous system, that is a tremendously strong connection. So uh, there's few cell types in the entire nervous system that are strongly connected to each other as these neurons are. And notably, these neurons are more strongly connected to each other than to any other cells in the entire nervous system. So from our behavior experiments, we found these eight cell types were really critical for song. And when you go and look in the connectome, it completely lines up with what we see. These eight cell types are also more strongly connected to each other than to any other neurons in the entire nervous system. So what we found is like this really core song circuit of neurons that are really strongly connected and that are obviously critical to produce song. I've got this separated. On the left are the neurons that were required for pulse. On the right, the neurons that were required for sign, and then the center, the, the ones that were required for both. And then I just grouped all the motor neurons into a single node there. Okay, so this is the song circuit. Um, the other thing that is worth highlighting here is that something that might seem surprising and seemed surprising to me at first was that there are really strong connections between the pulse and the sign network, uh, specifically from the pulse to the sign network. So, for example, if you go to slide 37, I've highlighted just VMS12 and DMS2. There's almost 10,000 connections from VMS12 to DMS2. But it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense because DMS2 is a sign neuron and it doesn't have any effect as far as we could tell on pulse song. And yet it somehow receives 10,000 connections from the pulse circuit. And as it turns out, while DMS2 is not required to produce normal amounts of pulse song, it is required to produce good pulse song. So what I mean by that is if you silence DMS2, for example, they still sing plenty of pulse, but the pulse song is kind of off. So the carrier frequency of these pulses increases to this unnatural level. Right? And as I mentioned before, females really care about the song not just being produced, but that it's actually the song they like, that it's their species-specific song. And so what the case is, is that while DMS2 and TN1A, when you silence them, the flies still sing plenty of pulse. The problem is, is the pulse song they sing is bad pulse song, right? And so this is bad for the flies. So these neurons, in fact, are not just part of the sign network. They're actually part of the pulse network as well. And so the way that this circuit is organized it's uh, in a way that we call it a nested circuit. So all of these neurons are involved in producing pulse song to one degree or another. And, and some of these neurons are also required to produce sign song. So these TN1A, DMS2, VPR9, and PIP10, they're required to produce normal amounts of every song. And then on the left, there's four cell types, PMP2, DPR1, DMS9, and DMS12. And these are really only for pulse. As far as we can tell, they play little to no role in producing sign song. So this is the kind of fundamental organizing principle of this circuit. I do want to note that in work done by my colleague Hiroshi Shizaki, he recorded calcium from these flies while they were singing songs. So he could actually 
uh, visualize the activity of these neurons during song. And all of that data agrees with the conclusions that we could identify based on the structure and the analyses, the behavioral analyses that I touched on. So if you look on slide 41, you can follow along. You can watch the splice sing. And you'll see the song trace on the bottom left. And then you'll see the calcium transient in these DPR1 neurons on the right side. And so you'll hear this right now. And so this is a really powerful uh, approach that he's developed that allows us to not just look at the behavior and the an anatomical structure of these neurons, but also the physiological properties of these neurons in behaving animals. And all of these things combined lead us to this basic conclusion where you've got this nest nested network organization that is responsible for producing these two song types. So when we come back to this question of how nervous systems control a common set of muscles to produce multiple behaviors, these were our options at the beginning. Uh, and this is essentially what the answer is. On the left side, you've got a song circuit where you've got this nested organization where there are neurons that are responsible for producing pulse and sign song, as well as some neurons that are really just pulse specific. I didn't talk about flight today, but flight appears to be a completely, almost completely, if not completely separate circuit, right? So all of those song neurons that I showed today, they have you know, very little to no connections with important flight neurons. Uh, in a separate analysis done by uh, Han Chong and colleagues, showed a similar thing where you could look at the input from the brain to the ventral nerve cord out to the wing motor neurons, and there appear to be very few overlapping uh, cells between song and flight. And so what you've got then is this common set of muscles, and they're organized in this kind of interesting way. You've got two very different behaviors, song and flight, and the neurons that control those appear to be largely separate. But then within song, you've got similar behaviors, but they're quite different and you know, different rhythmically and different dynamically. And what you have there is this kind of overlapping circuit that produces these behaviors. And so this provides some potential clues into how circuits like this might regulate you know, dynamic behaviors in a single you know, muscle group and other animals, including in ourselves. Uh, and these are things that can be explored in the future. And so if we come back to these kind of big questions we can address with fly song, you know, how do nervous systems control a common set of muscles? Well, here, like I said, it's a nested circuit that's differentially activated on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. The question of how nervous systems integrate multiple internal and external cues to control behavior, well, we now have the ability to really address that question in full and flies. So I didn't talk about this, but there have been a number of pieces of, liter of, of really beautiful studies over the past 10 to 15 years that have identified olfactory, visual, gustatory, memory, hunger centers in the brain with cell type specificity, as well as neurons that are involved in sensory integration, decision making, and descending command for song. Right? And we know the wing muscles and wing motor neurons, but before the work that we did, there was this kind of big black box in the middle. We didn't know the song circuit that controlled the actual behaviors. Now we've filled that in, and so we have the ability now to go all the way from the sensory neurons to the motor output. So we could study you know, how these neurons are actually firing in behaving animals by visualizing their calcium or recording from them physiologically, as well as we can manipulate these neurons. And we can look at the anatomy and the connectivity of these neurons to really kind of address this complex question in a full hierarchical circuit, which is really exciting. And so this is something that myself and a number of people in the field, I think, will, will be addressing in, in the near future. And then the final question of how nervous systems and behaviors evolve is something that I'm very actively working on and have previously worked on uh, to try to build new tools to, to answer these questions. And so, like I said before, we've got these kind of really amazing song differences that we can find across species. And now that we know what the courtship song circuit looks like, we know its components in Drosophila melanogaster, that gives us the ability to look at other species to see how that song circuit has changed. And I've developed tools with Yun Ding, David Stern, and colleagues previously that allow us to take the reagents from Drosophila melanogaster to label neurons like PIP10. So here on slide 51 in green is PIP10 in Drosophila melanogaster. And we've taken those tools and we've ported them, these genome editing tools, to other species. So here, Drosophila yacuba is a related species. And we can identify those same or homologous neurons across species using genetic tools. So here in magenta, you can see the Drosophila yacuba 
neurons overlaid on Drosophila, with the Drosophila melanogaster neuron. And this allows us to do some really cool things. So I'll, I'll close by showing you uh, PIP10 activation, again, just in isolated males. First, just as a refresher, this is what it looks like in Drosophila melanogaster, and this is what it sounds like. Okay, so the male fly, again, just by himself, but he starts singing courtship song because we activate those neurons. Now, Drosophila yucubas are related species. They sing different songs in Drosophila melanogaster. They sing something called clack song and then a, their own form of pulse song. And this is what happens when you activate those same neurons in Drosophila yucuba. So you've got the same homologous set of neurons, and when you activate them in each species, they produce the species-specific behaviors, right? And so now we can go into Drosophila yucuba, and we can look at these neurons that I've identified in Drosophila melanogaster that produce song, and we can see how they've changed to make the song different in these species, which I think will be really powerful to try to identify a kind of fundamental principles on how circuits evolve and vary in general to produce behavior differences without detrimentally affecting other behaviors. And so, yeah, with that, I'll conclose and we'll be happy to talk about anything here in detail or, you know, any other questions you might have about this basic approach or, you know, neuroscience and in, in flies or anything else. And so, uh, yeah, thank you again for the invitation and for, for listening. And hopefully, um, hopefully there's some, some thoughts or questions about any of this. Yeah, thank you so much, Josh. And I'd like to announce to everybody that we are opening the floor for questions or clarifications which uh, you might want to ask uh, we will bring you on stage so uh, please raise your hand and uh, yeah we will bring you up on the stage so um i'd like to reintroduce our guest speaker for those who just came in so uh, dr joshua lubis is a research scientist at the howard Hughes medical institute Sugenilia research campus and Josh is a first-generation college student that completed his undergraduate work at the Ohio State University. In his uh, graduate work at Paul Katz at uh, Georgia, uh, with Paul Katz at Georgia State University, he used an electrophysiology-based comparative approach to identify neural mechanisms underlying individual and species differences in sea slug swimming behavior. Since moving to Janelia, he has collaborated with a multidisciplinary group of researchers, including Barry Dixon, David Stern, Yun Ding, Paul Tilburg, and Stefan Sealfield to develop new methods in geno genome editing and neural circuit reconstruction that enable the structural, physiological, and functional properties of neural circuits to be compared across individuals and species at scale. His recent work has utilized his uh, this novel approach to reveal neural circuit mechanisms underlying the individual and species differences in drosophilia courtship behavior. So yeah, this is uh, our guest speaker, uh, Josh. So uh, before I give the mic to anyone who will be asking questions here, um, of course, Bob can read some questions uh, um, typed here on the room chat later on if there are any. So I would just like to request Josh to uh, uh, please tell us about the uh, Janelia Research Campus. Uh, myself, I had been a fan of Janelia, many researchers of Janelia, but I think uh, many of our audience uh, still would like to know, uh, or they have to know more about uh, Janelia. Uh, can you please tell us? Uh, sure, yeah. So Janelia is um, a research campus that was, I guess, emerged in 2006. Um, that's funded by the Howard Hughes Medical, Medical Institute. This is a, a nonprofit uh, research institute um, in the United States uh, that funds, you know, basic and biomedical research. Uh, it's a really kind of amazing place. Uh, so all, all of the uh, funding here is internal um, so that people don't have to um, spend a great deal of time trying to get grants and the funding is very generous. Uh, it's small research groups, so labs are limited to uh, six people in total. And so 
what you have is this really kind of collaborative atmosphere where different labs are collaborating with each other all the time. And that's certainly been true of me. Um, and then you've got these kind of different um, arms of research here. So there's uh, groups that are really focused on tool building. And so there's been a tremendous amount of success in, in generating like calcium indicators, like G-CAMPs that are used across uh, biological research by thousands and thousands of, of labs. Um, and as well as um, uh, people that build microscopes. So there's been uh, Eric Betzig, the Nobel Prize winning um, uh, microscopist, uh, uh, who uh, he and others have built just really incredible microscopes that we've been able to use. And so you've got these really great tool builders and then a number of you know really talented multidisciplinary biologists and computational scientists uh, that all work together to try to kind of tackle uh, big you know questions in biology and, and, and a big focus is to kind of work on large, risky science projects that um, are difficult to get traditional funding for. And so the idea is, is um, you know, you can basically try to tackle these big things that, you know, you can't get with, you can't uh, approach with normal granting mechanisms. And so, you know, things that have happened here that would be difficult to happen elsewhere were, you know, these very large connectomes, uh, some of which I talked about um, you know, these are really big, expensive, multi-million dollar projects. It's hard to get grants for these or to get, you know, traditional, you know, timeline publications for these. And so these are really big team projects that cost a lot of time and money, but then become tremendous resources for hundreds or thousands of labs in the community. Same thing with building these different tools, microscopes, uh, and building all of these genetic reagents for these fly lines. You know, we do a lot of this, you know, as individuals in our labs, but also there's these really large team efforts that have made thousands and thousands of fly lines that are used by you know hundreds of labs across the world, um, and so it's been a really uh, great place to be in in, in to do research uh, for for me for you know almost ten years now. It's a really exciting place to be. Yeah, thank you so much, Josh. So uh, I have some questions later in case there is still time, but in the meantime, we have here Kevin and Jonathan who are on stage. So uh, yeah, I think Jonathan came in first. So I'd like to give the mic to Jonathan and after that to Kevin. Hey, Josh, um, I'm a, a former um, HHMI researcher myself. I worked at um, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute at Yale in um, 89 and 88 and 89. Um, my question though has to do more with my PhD research at Yale, which was on pre-reproductive and post-reproductive isolation mechanisms during speciation. And so I'm curious as to whether in the course of your work or in the course of contextualizing your work, um, you can speak to um, the genetic architecture of these particular genes that you've isolated that control the um, nuances of the song that, you know, uh, for Melanogaster is 35 milliseconds and then for the other Drosophila species was, uh, was distinct. And um, I was very interested in the decoupling of the motor control of the flight mechanism of the wing movements versus the um, versus the wing as a an acoustic communicator communication device. So to um, uh, make my question more specific, um, my research was very interested in the um, in in pre-reproductive and post-reproductive genetic architecture in um, allopatric versus sympatric and parapatric speciation. And I'm wondering if the genes that control the localization on the chromosomes of the genes that control the nuances of the species identification um, aspects of the communication show any indication of being placed in a fashion that would allow for more rapid evolution than um, 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 uh, the, the, the components that control the flight components. Does that make any sense? Uh, hi, yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. So I could uh, unfortunately say off the top is that we don't know uh, much of anything about the genetic control or the genetic aspects of these species differences at the moment. Um, and that's something that I, I really hope to get into, um, but it's, it's unclear um, for the most part. So some things I can say is that there are uh, in addition to song as being a you know pre 
um, mating reproductive isolation mechanism, mm -hmm. uh, which it is because the females is particularly of some certain species are really specifically interested in, in songs from their own species. Yeah. Uh, there are other differences as well, one of which are gustatory signals. So there are these uh, contact pheromones that are really important for whether a male will choose to court a female of its species or other species at all. Mm -hmm. and, uh, these this circuitry and the genetic architecture of it is something that's starting to be teased out a mm. little bit more. Um, and so in this case, uh, at least in part, this, this circuitry is due to uh, what we, I guess we call like maybe like a decision making center in the brain. Uh, and these neurons express uh, or in are patterned to some degree by a gene double sex, which is a, a, a well known uh, sexual differentiation gene in these insects. And uh, it, this is still uh, not completely charted, but it would appear as though differences in double sex in at least some of these species uh, plays a role in generating plausibly circuit differences that underlie these behavior differences, right? So we're hopefully starting to be able to link, you know, directly from the genes to the neural circuits to the behaviors in that sense. Um, now, the question of whether um, there's something about, say, double sex or other genes that would allow them to be more evolvable than you know, uh, circuits or genes that control or regulate like the the architecture of flight circuits. Mm -hmm. um, I unfortunately can't say, but it is absolutely something that I am interested in. And you know, as a future hope of the research is, is that basically, I'm trying to get at this genetic question from the neural circuit end. So I want to identify the circuit basis of the difference, which hopefully will give me clues to identify the genetic basis of the difference. Others are going from the genetic end into the behavior of the circuit and i'm hoping that you know we'll all be able to meet in the middle in the relatively near future to begin answering some of these kind of i think really fundamental questions that you're you're bringing up okay uh, one one super quick follow-up um so i'm, I'm certain I, I would imagine that the uh, chromosomal location of the gene controlling the song is known yeah well it's uh, i mean it, uh, genes that control song in the sense that fruitless and double sex yes it's uh, darn the third chromosome but what I'm saying is the actual species differences in, say, for example, why one species produces pulse with a different interpulse interval, I don't know what the reason for that is. And it's not necessarily because of fruitless and double sex. Oh, so, okay. Uh, so, so my question is less, less, um, less profound and, and more basic. Um, is, is the location of the gene that controls this um, aspect of the song in an area that's subject to especially high crossover rates or whatever? No, so what I'm saying is it, I don't know which gene controls this particular. Ah, aspect. okay, okay. You you have the the, the the connectome, but not the genome. Okay, got it. Okay, thanks. In that sense, yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. And uh, we'd like to give the mic to Kelvin now. Uh, Kelvin, welcome to the stage. Oh yeah, hi, hi. Um, yeah, maybe a quick question. Um. Um, you said that uh, this may be, uh, you know, derived to the animal kingdom. Um, so, like we, we've known that, you know, spiders, peacock spiders, and drumming spiders, you know, their their rituals, mating rituals, uh, for a while now, you, you know, where they they uh, they drum their their feet, you know, as, as after the male the female approaches, he pats and strokes her before mating, you know, to try to convince her he's not food, and uh, you know, he, he displaying, you know, elaborate courtship, courtship dance, you, you know, this is for song, but, but also for, for touch and, uh, and, uh, and, and visual vision. Um, do you think this can be, can be, uh, you know, also used, used for that as, as well? Yeah, I mean, I think in general, yeah. So I mean, there's, with the spiders and then certainly with a lot of bird species you have these really kind of complex rapidly evolving uh, mating rituals as well and i think so some of the fundamental things that i think might be um not conserved necessarily but analogous um is something kind of cool that we see here is that the the pulse circuit is the larger of the circuits and then the sign circuit is, or sign neurons are kind of a subset of that pulse circuit and as it turns out, pulse is the more ancestral form of song here, and sign is a more evolutionarily recent. And so what uh, we think has happened is basically a subset of these neurons have basically evolved a new type of function to produce 
you know, you can basically elaborate on a behavior based on a, a base behavior that already existed. Um, there are other commonalities. Uh, leeches have a similar thing where leeches can uh, crawl and swim. And crawling is this larger network and appeared first evolutionarily. Swimming came later. And it's using a subset of the neurons within that network. And so I suspect or I hypothesize that in the peacock spiders or in other species that have evolved elaborate courtship rituals, that there's kind of like a ground plan and a common ancestor that can kind of be elaborated on over time. And so I suspect that we would see something similar like that in the spiders and the birds as well. Now, like to the uh, general circuit organization, you know, uh, from having, you know, particular receptors during touching, which is also something tapping is a thing that the flies do, and that feeds into a general uh, courtship promoting circuit that then generates these complex behaviors. I, I feel confident that those kind of fundamental architectures are conserved, um, but whether, you know, the way that this circuit is actually organized is similarly organized for their rhythmic behaviors. Uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say that, you know, they're, they're, you could do that in a lot of different ways is what I would say. There's a lot of different ways you could organize a circuit to produce rhythmic behaviors. Um, but the thing that I think is potentially interesting and generalizable is basically how you can partition different chunks of circuits to do, to do things to control common sets of muscles. And, and uh, what we see here appears to be similar to other cases where we've been able, people have been able to investigate at this level of detail. And so it starts to seem as though that might be a fundamental thing that we would see across the animal kingdom in, in many cases. Hopefully that answered your question, but please let me know if not. Oh, yeah, 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 of course, you know, spiders are arachnids, not insects, but, but yeah, yeah, that's very, very, very much so. Yeah, just incredible, you know, the the peacock ones and the drumming, drumming ones, you know, like the YouTube videos of the, of the plucking the, the threads of the web, you know, it's just incredible. I, I love it all. Thanks a lot. Yeah, there's, I mean, yeah, looking at courtship, yeah, I completely agree. They're like really amazing. And then the, the bird courtship behaviors, and even you can look at some of the, there's some Hawaiian Drosophila courtship behaviors as well. You know, I only focused on song today, but they do a number of other really interesting things. And, and some of these other species, particularly some of the island species are really incredibly elaborate or definitely worth looking up. Yeah, thank you so much, Kevin. There there are two questions here by Roderick that uh, he has sent me. So uh, question number one, could the identified core set of neurons involved in fly courtship songs serve as a model for studying how other animals produce diverse movement patterns using a common set of muscles? That's the first question. Yeah, that's exactly what we think in you know, it was really the goal of, of this type of work is to try to, because we can study these things in, in these flies at like such a precise level, um, we try to see if, you know, we can identify basically the way it works here, and then that can hopefully provide clues into how other species do it as well. And so the, the basic idea is that we think that this could be a common way that you basically uh, can have, you know, behaviors control that control a common set of muscles could be organized, right? And so um, there's clues that this is true for vertebrate breathing, for example, right? So the ability to gasp or hyperventilate or breathe slowly um, appear to be controlled potentially by similar premotor circuit organizations, but it's it's more difficult to study in those animals. Um, but I think as evidence accumulates in systems like in Drosophila and elsewhere where it can be studied more readily, um, it can provide researchers with you know stronger hypotheses about what to look for in, in other more difficult to study animals as well. And so. Yeah, we absolutely think that it's something that could be common, for sure. Yeah, thank you. So I'll just read the second question of Roderick. So he said, uh, maybe you had also mentioned this in your uh, presentation a while ago, but anyway, I'd like to read the question. The research highlights the role of specific neurons, such as DM1A and DMS2, in controlling uh, sign song production. How might the manipulation of these neurons shed light on the evolutionary or origins of courtship behaviors in fruit, fruit flies? Yeah, so I, I think, um, yeah, I might have touched on it a bit, but it, that because um, of the, the basic 
like which neuro or excuse me, which behaviors are more evolutionarily ancient and which ones are more recent and the ability to find neurons like these that have functions in them, both behaviors. Um, it tells us or it suggests to us that, you know, these neurons exist in a common ancestor and involved in particular behaviors and then somehow are elaborating or building upon what they can do. Um, and the, we have hypotheses about some potential mechanisms by which that might happen. Um, and then notably, uh, these, these, some of these behaviors are not just gained, but they're, they can also be lost. And so, for example, those two neurons are involved in producing sign song. Sign song has been lost in some species like Drosophila yucuba. Uh, in recent work, uh, beautiful work by my collaborator, Yun Ding, who has a lab at Penn, uh, has recently shown, this is on BioArchive, that some species that have lost the ability to produce sign song appear to have lost some TN1A neurons. Um, and so that's, you know, completely consistent with what we see is that these neurons are, are required for pulse and sign song. Uh, these animals appear to have lost some TN1A neurons, which affect sign song, but doesn't affect their ability to produce pulse song. Um, and so all of these pieces of evidence are kind of building upon each other in, a, I think, a really cool and interesting way. And I think we're, you know, right on the kind of the verge of being able to, to, to really answer some of these fundamental questions that have been difficult to approach so far because of the, the new tools that we've had and we've built. Yeah, uh, thank you, Josh. Actually, I'm very interested to know a little more about your fly recording studio. Yeah, so uh, yeah, uh, if you will tell us something about it. And my other question is also, I you had the uh, indicated that you're using optogenetics and machine learning uh, in this study. So maybe is there a wish technology or something that you already have to bring the research to a higher level so that these technologies will be tools for you to answer your next questions about this topic? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, first, the, the Fly Recording Studio um, is a really nice collaboration between a number of people at Genelia, including uh, there's a, a group of engineers here uh, that really like focus in, on building like high quality um, uh, behavioral experimental rigs that can be um, built outside of Genelia where people don't necessarily have the same types of resources that, that we're fortunate to have. And so uh, the basic idea here is, is that, you know, we are trying to figure out a way to just record a lot of song and so there was a lot of experimentation with basically the types of microphones we need, how far the microphones need to be placed apart so that you don't get crosstalk between the channels, so on and so forth, that kind of basic stuff. And then there was a lot of, I think, pretty sophisticated engineering in just in, in basically identifying the easiest way to get circuit boards that will be reliable, that we could order, you know, solder microphones onto and then deliver all that, all that information and data, you know, into a computer. And then simultaneously control, you know, lights optogenetically. Um, and so I guess all of it comes together and it was a lot of work, a lot of trial and error, but it ends up being a pretty, I'd say, fairly like straightforward set of tools that hopefully people can build. We In the paper that we put out on BioArchive, we have plans for every single aspect of it and little videos showing people how to build the parts that need to be built by hand. Um, and so the hope is that anyone else that's interested in recording, you know, fly songs, but also, you know, this this kind of recording studio could be modified to, you know, record, you know, audio signals from larger uh, insects as well. You could hopefully take these plans and just build this type of thing for for relatively little money. So ultimately, it's just a big box with a bunch of microphones, and then all of that data is 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 transported into the computer where it's being recorded in real time. And then we've got a separate controller that can turn lights on and off, and we sync all these things up so we can line up exactly when our our light stimuli, our optogenetic stimuli, you know, came in, so we can see how that affects song. Um, and so it's yeah, it's it's a I, I think a really a nice 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 rig for that reason. And then in terms on the ana the analysis side, yeah, so we're using a machine learning approach uh, to segment songs into the pulse and sign components. And so the way that this works is that we do some ground truth classification. You know, I just manually identified a bunch of pulse waves, a bunch of sine waves, uh, interpulse intervals, and trained a convolutional neural network on that data uh, and was able to produce, uh, you know, a classifier that has great, you know, precision and accuracy that will you know, quite quickly and automatically um, 
uh, analyze and segment these songs. Uh, and, you know, this, you know, nowadays is a relatively straightforward and simple task for, for, you know, convolutional neural networks or other machine learning approaches to do. Uh, the way that that's taken off in the past, I, I mean, really just five years uh, has been pretty mind blowing for, for our research. All right. So that is a huge help for segmenting fly songs. But in addition to this work, I, I didn't talk today about uh, a number of projects that I've been doing, working on um, expansion microscopy and fly neuroanatomy reconstruction, similar to the to the connectomes I showed you today, but using a different approach and using light microscopy and expansion microscopy, which is a different technique we can talk about if interested. But um, machine learning applied to this has been a complete uh, revelation because it allows us to uh, I, I'm quantifying, you know, petabyte, petabyte scale data sets rapidly um, using, you know, trained convolutional neural networks and other machine learning algorithms. And it really allows us to do, you know, really incredible things to try to look at variation in, in circuits and behaviors across individuals and species and, and to do things that are, weren't even, I didn't even dream of doing literally five years ago. So we can talk about more specifics of that if you want, but just generally speaking, I, I use uh, machine learning in a number of different aspects of my work now, and it's been pretty incredible. Thank you so much. And, you know, with the new technology that we have, I just noticed that this research about artificial intelligence bringing a virtual fly to life also in Janilia. And just imagine, of course, the sound that you can combine with it. You can make a film about a love story of a fly and probably maybe make some music out of it. Uh, just by sampling from the sounds that you have in your lab, and probably uh, it's going to be a blockbuster if you you know how to write the backstories and make the film uh, for this. So yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, collaborative works with you, including in the arts, because uh, you already offer some uh, consistency and uh, true data based on your scientific research. So maybe Josh, tell us later. Um, what other works are you doing in your lab? Uh, we are excited to hear about it. But in the meantime, I'd like to give the mic to Jafir, who has uh, who is here on stage. Jafir, welcome. Oh, thank you. It's been a long time, Cecilia, Bob, everybody here. Uh, good to see you guys. Yeah, uh, nice to see you too. So uh, we are a little bit back because we've been lying low for a while since Clubhouse made some new um, new conditions for here so yeah we are here but but i'm i had also been very busy with work so it's kind of hard i was overwhelmed but i'm very glad that you're all here who are uh, supporting quantum photonics so yeah thank you jafir do you have a question or some clarifications about this yes i would like to ask uh, from this uh uh the sounds do they sound uh, they have recorded. Have he played it back? Uh, do they understand it? The uh, fly flute. Do they understand? You know, did they react to that song? That he did. He get a chance to play it back to them. Uh, yeah. So uh, I haven't done that work, but that work has been done in the past. And it, yeah. The, so you can play male songs of, to female flies, uh, and they respond to it, and, and, and they increase. Um, essentially, if you you can. Uh, play song in the presence of a male and if you play good courtship song males will successfully mate with the females and if you play abnormal or bad courtship song they won't so some of these types of playback experiments have been really critical to trying to assess like what's important about courtship song to females and you know how it, different aspects of it you know contribute uh, to female preferences um, so yeah that that definitely is something that's been done in and has been shown to be really critical for mating success in these animals. So is this just a, a, a sound or has a visual interacted with it? Do they see and hear at the same time or just hear it and act to it? Uh, yeah, so they see and hear it at the same time, but um, certain things, so you can also just do sound and there will be responses to the sound in both males and females. So males will respond by singing but also becoming more aggressive so when they hear song they assume there's a female present or at least this is the way we would interpret their behavior and so they start to sing as well but then they also become more aggressive because they want to you know try to beat off rival males um and 
just sound alone can trigger female responses as well. But in the actual wild and the lab setting, they are also seeing visual signals. And while in Drosophila melanogaster, uh, visual signals are important uh, to the females. They're, they're very important to the males. So the males will court uh, like a dot uh, that is moving, if it's about female size, for example. Um, um, the, and other species, visual signals are even more important because there are more elaborate wing displays in addition to sound and, and wings sometimes have, you know, spots and different patterns on them that are important. And so, you know, it varies by species, but I guess uh, long story long, uh, visual signals are also important with sound, but if you just play sound alone, that also can just trigger behavioral responses. Nice. My last question, do they have smell? Uh, yeah, they do. Um, so they have the normal volatile olfactory, you know, chemicals they smell. Uh, and then there are gustatory uh, pheromones as well. And some of these are important uh, for deciding whether or not the male will choose to court a female, depending on the, uh, the pheromones that the female has. So uh, there are two different things that have been shown uh, that have been, I think, really critical. Uh, number one is that, you know, uh, certain species have different pheromones. And so the males will sense pheromones of, say, the, the species that they can't actually uh, court or mate with, and they will avoid, you know, courting those species, whereas they'll be attracted to the species that have their pheromones. Uh, in addition to that, uh, males that have tried but failed to mate successfully previously by trying to, to court a mated female, so those females have pheromones deposited on them by males, and so males that fail to court or fail to mate will sense those pheromones, and that actually causes them to learn, uh, basically to avoid females that have those those smells on them in the future. And so some of the circuitry in the brain has been linked or worked out to understand basically how learning and memory affects courtship decisions, you know, in flies that have previous experience as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Good luck. Thank you. Bob? Yes, I have a, I have a question. Do flies respond uh, either in lower frequencies or higher frequencies than people do? Uh, you mean in audio frequencies? Correct. Um, well, let's see. So the we're not manipulating any of the those sounds that you're hearing, right? So that's the same frequency. So we can hear those as well. They're just far too quiet for us to hear if they're not amplified. Um, and the whether they hear something at a lower or higher frequency that we can't hear, I actually don't know. I would imagine that data exists, but I have to say I'm ignorant of it. So I'm sorry, I can't tell you. All right, thank you. I was thinking about dogs being able to hear better than we. Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. I'm going to look into that later because I'm not sure of the answer to it. Yeah, I think the question above was quite great. I'm also interested to know uh, on, for of course, they sing the the male fly sing this song, but on what frequency? Um, because of course they are com communicating with the same species. Why is it so? It's because I was just reminded in humans, for instance, when you are mind wandering and you are stimulating creativity, they would uh, like talk. There are studies about uh, the coffee shop noise and uh, yeah that it's very good actually for creativity because you would hear this continuous just like white noise uh, being there uh, at a certain frequency if you do the the sound of like a mixer or uh, uh, yeah uh, it is too um, disturbing and then on the other hand if uh, the the environment is very quiet. It's not really conducive to creativity. So they think that mind wandering or staying in a coffee shop, if uh, you're doing creative work, uh, it's very stimulating. So I think that's, that would be very inter interesting to study in flies if it could uh, uh, also be applied in the future to uh, other species, actually, because, uh, yeah, there is the neuroscience of sound and at what level. So I was just thinking about that. 
So, uh, Josh, uh, I'm very interested to hear what other works are you doing uh, because we hope that we can invite you back here again in Quantum Photonics to talk about your works or upcoming papers. Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, so I'm currently working, I previously published uh, geez, uh, late 2022 a paper using uh, this technique called expansion microscopy to uh, reconstruct neural circuits. And so um, for those that don't know, expansion microscopy uh, is this technique that was in, invented by uh, Fei Chen, Paul Tilburg, and Ed Boyden, um, of, I guess, how many years ago? I don't know, eight years ago or something like this. And this is a really kind of incredible <laughs> technique that they came up with that allows you to actually physically increase the size of tissue. Um, and so, like, generally, when we try to image something using light microscopy, you come up against the diffraction limit of light, and you can only resolve things to a certain level. And so... Like the ability to generate those connectomes that we look at in the fly uses electron microscopy, which allows you to go below the light diffraction limit so you can get, you know, four nanometer resolution. You can trace out these really fine things. Typically, you can't do that with light microscopy. Just the laws of physics don't allow it. But with expansion microscopy, they, they thought, well, since you can't make your microscopes any better, it's not physically possible. What if we just made the thing that we want to image bigger? So therefore, we get better resolution just by making the thing bigger. Uh, and they amazingly figure out how to do this. And uh, in a very simple way, you basically embed your tissue, in our case, a brain, in this kind of gel matrix. And then it acts like a diaper when you put it in water, and it physically expands isometrically so that you retain all of the structure the, the structural relationships of your brain, but you've just now made it bigger. And so we were using that method to reconstruct neural circuits using light microscopy, which is really powerful because it, it can be very fast and it allows us to have molecular specificity in, in, in conjunction with, with neuroanatomy. Um, so this was really cool and exciting, but I've been striving to try to figure out a way to do this in more uh, densely labeled circuits. To, so basically to do something similar to what we can do with electron microscopy, but to be able to do it with light microscopy. And there's a number of reasons why this would be of interest to us, um, not the least of which is that it'd be way cheaper and faster. Um, and so I'm currently working on methods, new methods to do this, and we're pretty excited about results, but I can't share anything yet. But I hope that, you know, before too long, we'll have a paper out and I'd be happy to come back and talk about it. I think it would be pretty cool. Yeah, thank you so much. We, we really look forward to that. Uh, yeah, we hope we can invite you again here in quantum photonics. So um, moving forward, what are the key questions that remain unanswered in your quest to understand the neural basis of courtship behaviors? What experimental approaches or methodologies could be employed to address these questions effectively? In short, uh, are you bringing this research to a higher level uh, to answer maybe probable questions which came up? during your research? Yeah, so I mean, my main focus, I'm really interested in variation. So I'm interested in how things vary across individuals and species. Um, and so on that end, I'm really applying some of these tools that I've built. So for example, circuit reconstruction with expansion microscopy, but also the tools that we built that I showed at the end that allow us to transfer genetic reagents across species to try to see how these circuits change. So that's a real big area of focus for me. But if you think just within Drosophila melanogaster, there are still a number of questions that remain. Um, and so thinking just about how that song circuit generates song, you know, we have a pretty good idea, I think, of how it's done now. But, you know, admittedly, we haven't actually, you know, recorded from all of these neurons while the fly is singing um, at a high enough speed to know exactly how they fire to produce these really fast songs. Um, traditionally, the way you would do that is with electron or excuse me, electrophysiology which we can do in flies, but it's hard to do in the behaving fly because when they're singing, they're vibrating. And electrophysiology requires actually putting like a, a glass electrode into a neuron. These animals are really small. When everything's vibrating, that makes things difficult. Um, and so future development that I think will really make this accessible will be in voltage imaging, voltage imaging uh, systems. So basically new types of dyes or genetically encoded voltage indicators that allow us to image not just calcium in neurons but voltage you know at the millisecond level um and when we can do this then we'll really be able to i think you know with high confidence understand exactly how these behaviors are produced which will be really powerful um this isn't something that i'm working on but there are plenty of labs 
working toward this because it would be a really powerful um, a tool to have. And so for me, I'm just waiting for it to, to, to get working. And once it gets working, I'd be, I'll be excited to use it personally. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm also very interested to know what, what is the general genre of the songs that this splice try to make. So uh, anyway, there is another question here from Rose. What are the potential applications of this research beyond understanding courtship behaviors in fruit, fruit flies? How might insights uh, gained from studying fly neural circuits inform research in fields such as robotics or neuroprosthetics? Yeah, so I mean, uh, people in robotics, I think there's a lot of potential here. And so, um, Cecile, you, you alluded to the, the new uh, AI fly that just came out. Um, and I think there's a, there's a real potential to kind of combine uh, that type of approach with what we're doing here um, to guide robotics development, for example. So uh, what we're currently doing in collaboration with some of those authors on that, on that AI fly paper is to actually take all of this information, all of these connectomes and this, you know, physiological and functional data that we have and to insert that into the, you know, the artificial computer fly to see if we can, if we can actually get that fly to produce proper behavior based on neuronal signals that we know are real. Um, and I think how that could guide robotics, for example, is by identifying number one, what we might have missing, but also what's really critical to get the animal behaving in a naturalistic way, even if it's not critical to the way the nervous system does it, right? So it's basically identifying the key components of the circuitry that can generate the type of behavior that you're interested in. Um, and so I think there's a lot of potential on that front. And, and, and in a more basic way, um, thinking about how to design circuits potentially that are are similar to what we see naturalistically that, that maybe provide clues as to ways that would be really efficient ways to go about this robotically, right? So to to potentially design circuits to, to be, you know, multifunctional in a way, um, as opposed to having to build, you know, multiple circuits out for every possible function could provide, you know, the ability for robotics to be more flexible and also potentially in the future to, to, to learn, you know, using AI within the systems. Um, you know, and there are people that are using a lot of this insect work on, on robotics now. Um, people have done this, I think, quite successfully with uh, looking at cockroach actual behavior and cockroach neural signals and trying to build, you know, little robots that can go into, unfortunately, into, you know, disaster areas to try to find um, to people and, and things like this. And so I think there's a lot of potential there where we can take some of this real biologically, biological information and to, you know, build biologically inspired uh, robots. and, and uh, I can't speak to prosthetics as much uh, directly, but I, I think anytime we can really um, like clearly delineate how neural circuits, you know, with cell type specificity are, are, are doing things, uh, I think that this is really powerful, basically, in giving you kind of the most complex picture of how something's done. And then, you know, when you're trying to design devices like this, you can start with the most complex and just keep pairing back until you, until you get the response or get the result you want. And so I think it's really powerful to get, you know, an idea of how nature works in all its complexity, and then you can figure out what you need, you know, to get the result of what you want in your device. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, uh, great. Yeah, I, I really look forward to exploring that. So uh, there are many things that are appearing on research, and probably sometimes when you are in a multidisciplinary field and other researchers also like for example about that uh, um, research on the the fly from also janelia that i was speaking uh, bringing a virtual fly to life in terms of simulation as cooperating with your group i think you can do so many things because uh, there is a, a deluge of uh, a lot of the technology that's coming up. So, yeah, I would like to uh, really say kudos to your group for this research. And I know that we've been here for almost one hour and 30 minutes now. And usually I ask the speaker, how much more time does he have for us? So I'll ask uh, Josh now, how much more time do you have for us? Uh, I can stay a bit longer. I can stay for another uh, 10 minutes anyway, if, if there are more questions. I'm happy to, to chat. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Josh. I have a curiosity question. Maybe it's not really very relevant, but I'm just very curious because you said earlier that when a, a, a male fly tries to make a song, of course, uh, how is it is it attracting females? Uh, is uh, there is a specific type of song based upon you know a song that really attracts a certain species? So given things on equal footing, for instance, they are of the same species, both both the male and the female. I was just wondering, in terms of maybe I was thinking about competition and also evolution, uh, to the point that uh, given all things equal and they're having the same songs and standards, um, how, what is the most attractive song maybe for just like you know in the species of uh, Drosophila melanogaster? Uh, what is the most popular song uh, that attracts females or is a successful tool for courtship? Maybe you did not research that yet, but I was just, you know, very curious about that. Yeah, so uh, it's a great question. So the one thing we know for sure that really matters is the interval between pulses. And so if, if that's at about 35 milliseconds, they like that the most. And, and we can not only does it seem like they like it the most because in playback experiments, that's the most successful, but um, my colleagues, one of the co-authors of this work I talked about today, Caillou Wang, along with Barry Dixon, showed that they could actually find neurons in the female brain that really specifically are tuned to this 35 millisecond interval, which I think is pretty incredible. Um, but I think it's largely a mystery to exactly which of these components are most important and, and how. And actually, this is, you know, an, an additional benefit of the work that we've done here is previously, you know, to try to assess that what people did is they would, you know, take a male that can't sing and then they would just play a song and see what the female responded to, basically what, how successful the male was. And that's not a horrible approach, but it's also really artificial in the sense that, you know, males sing at specific times as we talked about earlier, like what the female is seeing and what the female is feeling in addition to the song is important. And so when you do these playback experiments, it's really artificial because the female's hearing the song, but the male might be in a different place and is not extending a wing. It's, it's kind of detached. So a cool thing about these experiments and what we've done here is we've identified these neurons that if you silence or activate them, they affect specific features of song like really precisely. And so what that will enable is future work where you, it's not so artificial. So instead, what you can do is you have a male that's singing, and you can just say, I'm going to make this male sing song with a bad inner pulse interval. And I can do that now because we can affect a single neuron that we know only influences you know, that parameter if we stimulate it in a certain way. And so now we can really kind of precisely home in on what females care about. And so I think that's uh, there'll be future work that I think will really um, approach that question in a, a way that hasn't been possible before, that will be pretty cool to see. Uh, I, have another, uh, quick question. I think Jafir and Kevin would like to make a. Yeah, go ahead. I think Kevin was uh, prior to me with his question. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, mine's quick. I know we're at the end and you do mind clicking away. So, uh, I just what came to mind is did you study, um, you, you know, um, when you're. Uh, you know the, the pulses, and uh, you know, like you said, uh, if they're hungry, the mood they're in, or, or the success they had, and maybe even the female. You know, if she's hungry. Same, same thing. You know, maybe she'll have to repulse. You know, repulse, uh, no pun intended. Uh, you know, so uh, so so he'll he'll try again, and then maybe things, certain things will interrupt, or he'll stop halfway through a pulse, stuff like that. Or maybe future studies, if you haven't studied that. Um, all right. So, yeah, they're saying like uh, if, um, well, so number one, I mean, people uh, have studied like how flies that are hungry or if flies experience threats, for example, how that affects courtship. Um, and it's kind of a complex question, but basically it depends on how hungry they are or how strong the threat is or how far they're along they are in courtship, how they respond to those things. Um, so, uh, generally speaking, like it, it's kind of like a choosing to sing or not to sing or choosing to court or not to court or abandoning courtship or not abandoning courtship. The, uh, the idea of, um, like whether, 
a courtship song is interrupted, like in the moment and how they respond to that. Uh, there's a really nice paper that just came out on BioArchive from Vanessa Ruda's lab that show that looked at how uh, two males that are courting at the same time interact and, and how the females respond to those males. And basically, uh, they really beautifully show that you know what happens is males will sing and they'll both be singing, but then they'll fight each other. And so they basically intersperse their courtship song with aggressive song, which is similar to courtship, but it's actually different. And it's controlled at least in part by different neurons. And when this happens, uh, it doesn't appear as though like the courtship song just like starts over from where it stopped. Like they'll basically fight for a little bit and then start a new bout of courtship song. Um, and then kind of uh, interestingly and amazingly, as long as one of the males is singing good courtship song, uh, the female will you know, end up mating with basically whatever male happens to be in position when she's ready to mate if she hears good song. And so sometimes a male that sings worse courtship song or no courtship song at all could potentially or successfully mate uh, basically just by getting lucky or being in the right place at the right time. Um, so a, hopefully that kind of answers the question. It, it basically it's complicated, but if it gets interrupted, it doesn't like just pick up where it left off to kind of start over again. Um, but yeah, that, that's the basic gist, I think. Thank you, Josh. I think Jafir was trying to speak a while ago. Jafir? Yes, I got a couple of questions. Uh, for, uh, can, 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 can they make a sound that uh, makes them uh, uncomfortable while well, they will fly away? Where I, I know there's certain places you don't want them to be, but you can play certain uh, sound that they don't like so that way instead of trying to kill them or anything but deter them also can they play certain sound or have uh, like uh, hundreds of them or something it's like ones like hundred sounds or something that deter uh, like mosquitoes or something and all that other harmful thing that harm humans can we use certain sounds to you know deter those hope that makes sense yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I don't know if there is a frequency or something that you could play that, like, say, we wouldn't sense that would keep uh, fruit flies like off of your bananas. Uh, I'm not sure if that that exists, but it might be the case. Um, in the terms of courtship, females actually have a rejection sound that they play, and when males are fighting, they have their aggressive courtship song too. So, um, or, or or females actually. Uh, maybe they have a somewhat of a rejection sound, but they also have a, like a positive, like pro courtship sound as well. So these, these do exist. They're far less prominent than the courtship song that the males produce, but they definitely exist. So there are things that I guess would be somewhat repulsive to males, uh, at least in that sense. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Jafir. And so, yeah, I think we are, um, at the top of our uh, hour here in Quantum Photonics. Uh, we hope that we could invite our uh, guest speaker, Josh, to come back here again because he has such very interesting answers to questions which you know people just probably ignored but only thought of these questions when they came into the room. And this is very educational and uh, yeah, uh, it's a great uh, research. So, uh, Josh, thank you so much for being here with us in Quantum Photonics. I'd like to give the mic to you if you have some parting shots for us. And yeah, we hope we can invite you here again. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. This was uh, really super fun. I really appreciate it and I had a really good time. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And uh, I'd like to uh, please check out our upcoming rooms here in Quantum Photonics, uh, maybe in a day after tomorrow. And we have several rooms until the end of the month with really great speakers. So uh, I'd like to give the mic to Bob uh, in case he has some last message here. And then after that, to Darcel. I think on behalf of everyone in the audience tonight, uh, this was a wonderful discussion. And I thank you very much. Yeah, Darcel, so please help us close the room. My pleasure, Cecile, and thank you, uh, Doctor, for a great discussion. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, so to close the room, we're going to start our countdown from lucky number six. Is everybody ready? Ready. Ready. Six. 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 Jafir, five. Five. Kevin, four. 
Kevin Cuatro. Four. Cuatro. <laughs> Bob Three. Three it is. Cecil Dos Equis. Dos Equis. The doctor, your numero uno. Would you call out a last number, please? One. <laughs> Thank you so much, Josh. Uh, please come back to Quantum Photonics soon. Yeah. Uh, good night, everyone, and see you in the next rooms. <laughs> <laughs>